Revelation was a book which was written to help those who were going through a difficult situation until the end of the temple system, the old heavens and the earth, the old covenant system was finally completed, as Jesus said was going to happen within that generation. And it happened between AD 66 and 70. So it was written. The book of Revelation was not written later, as some people talk about. It was written while the temple was still standing. And it was written to help those who are going to go through those things that were shortly to take place. And therefore, all of it, and obviously it's highly symbolic, it's written in apocalyptical language, it's written with reference to Old Testament, the books of Daniel and uh, Ezekiel and other books. And if you don't have an understanding of the symbolic nature of it, then you'll take it and you'll have all of the stuff that's been written from a futurist perspective, you know, the 666 mark of the beast and all of this stuff, you know, tribulation. And they tie it to so-called tribulation. Well, actually, that tribulation, as Jesus said, took place, was never going to happen again. And it will all be taken place in the generation that followed. Therefore, there is no, no tribulation like that as it describes in Matthew 24. Luke describes the same thing in terms of armies surrounding Jerusalem. Um, and the whole thing was to fulfill the end of the old system, um, the heavens and the earth coming to an end, which was the temple, representing the old covenant, which finally took place at that destruction. So Jesus gave them a generation in which they could turn and follow him and not be subject to what was going to go on in Jerusalem, that period was the end of days, the fulfillment when the resurrection and the judgment would take place at the end of the old covenant age. So we're talking about a spiritual resurrection of the old covenant into the new, nothing to do with individual re resurrection. And you can read that in Daniel chapter 12, which links the destruction of the old with the beginning of the new. And Jesus said this, this is the birth pangs. Well, you don't have the birth being the end. You have the birth being the beginning. So the end of the old, where the kingdom um, would be preached into the whole world, was all about the end of the old, not the beginning at uh, the end of the old and the beginning of the new we're in the new covenant therefore the fulfillment mm -hmm. was what was described figuratively in revelation 20 about you know that system in which the enemy could not stop what god was doing but try to uh but it's very figurative language and you've you've got all sorts of illustrative things in there which are not supposed to be taken literally Nowhere else in the Bible does it talk about a thousand years reign of Jesus. There is no mention of a millennium. All of that is a fanciful coming up with things. Try to explain those things. When if you took it at literal face value, that revelation sh was to take place shortly. It's happened. Therefore, we don't need to be concerned with those things. Now, obviously, you know, you could write books about the whole thing and um, people have written books from all sorts of different perspectives about revelation and everything else it was not it's not something that we should be reading today in looking for the future it is a history and it and you don't, if you don't understand jewish symbolism apocryphal language you just won't understand it and you'll come up with things that try and interpret it by the newspapers of the day hence some of the things described within the you know the pouring out of judgment um, the seals being broken and the trumpets being sounded and all of those type of things, you know, they come up with things like, Oh, these are talking about intercontinental ballistic missiles. And these are talking about, you know, scorpion helicopters and tanks and all this stuff. And it's just nonsense, you know, but it's sold millions and millions of books and films have been done about it. Um, unfortunately, the simplest answer is that it's a book about the end of the old covenant. It was a book about the temple coming to an end. It's a book about what they were going through in the persecution that they were facing from Nero. 
Nero Caesar is 666 in the Hebrew language, it's 606 in Latin language. So if you read the early Latin versions of Revelation, you'll find it says 606, not 666. Um, so you've got different different perspectives on the same thing. Of course, they had to write in code. They wouldn't have been able to read the book of Revelation and talk about Nero Caesar. They would all have been probably carted off. But a lot of them were, you know, Nero Caesar burnt Christians as Roman candles. So he was a bad guy looking to enforce the Roman religious things and the Roman political system on the world, including Jerusalem and that Judaic people who were under Roman rule, of course. You know, so eventually there were a number of things because Jesus warned of various things that were going to take place, wars, rumors of wars, all that sort of stuff leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem um, in which those things took place. You know, I think if you read the book itself, even the very first chapter, it says these things are shortly to take place, soon to take place, not two, three thousand years later, soon to take place. And they did. Yeah, uh, for I uh, uh, the, the, what you just said is not a problem for me. I can understand and follow that, you know, and I, I really believe that. But I have problems with chapter twenty because yeah. it says a thousand years, and it says that Satan was bound for yes. a thousand years. I thought, has he ever been bound? I well, mean, when was but, Satan but in bound? Term, in terms of the gospel going up through the whole world, there's a sign there. It, it's symbolic. He wasn't chained up in a prison. No, no of course. But, it, but, but his power to stop the gospel into the whole world was limited. It was stopped because okay. the gospel did go through the whole world and the end came. And it says yeah. that even in the book of Acts, they were there present under all nations under heaven when they preached the gospel at the book of Acts. So the symbolic thing of what Jesus said, the gospel would be preached into the whole world and then the end would come, were fulfilled, literally. Paul said several times that the gospel has gone out into the whole world. Yeah, but but you then know. he was let, then he was uh made free satan for a short time well that was symbolic about you see satan is not satan satan is the accuser yeah see, we, we tend to read oh satan capital s there was no mm -hmm. capital letter on that word satanos and this where it talks about satan and his angels were thrown in the lake of fire it was talking about those who were representing the accuser of the brethren who and the angels of the the messengers of the accuser of the brethren which were persecuting christians during that period which was represented by the high priest and those who were pharisees and things who were persecuted paul included who was one yeah. of the persecuting christians it's not talking about a literal devil or a satan satan satanus is a word which says accuser mm. it doesn't necessarily have to mean a personal devil so you've got to look at the context to say what it meant so what was bound well the the jewish political leaders could not stop the gospel going out that's literally all it meant it didn't mean he was put in this you know the chains or symbolic language of apocalyptical things to say mm. hey this gospel going out to the whole world make disciples of all nations you know the the accuser is not going to stop you doing that mm. yeah? but we've we've interpreted it very much from a modern linguistical perspective and a modern understanding and try to interpret these things in a way which doesn't make sense when you look at it talking about the heavens and the earth being the temple and the old system coming to an end and it's covenant language you know, mm -hmm. about what happened it was a covenant out of the death of the old covenant the new covenant came you know. but when was he uh, made free when was well, he we're not, yeah, we're, we're not we're talking not talking 
Yeah, I know, but when when we're talking was about it? literal devil, we're talking about the fact that this was something that then brought about the destruction of Jerusalem. So you could say to bring about the end, the Jewish people can were opposing Rome as well as Christians, and then they were persecuted for their insurrection, and they were destroyed by the Roman armies who came on Jerusalem and besieged it for four years. The whole land is talking about what happened to Jerusalem, not at what happened to Christians. Yeah. So he was he was let loose at when Jer at the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. You got the that symbolic was, language. It's all yeah, symbolic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. That's symbolic of the destruction of Jerusalem. Yeah. When, so the accusation. Uh, found it. Oh, sorry. About the destruction. You see, if the yeah. destruction took place just after Jesus went into heaven, you wouldn't have had 40 years for the Jewish people to turn and follow Jesus. He gave mm -hmm. a whole period for those in Jerusalem to begin to follow him and leave Jerusalem. And at the signs that he said, the warnings that he gave, all the Christians left Jerusalem and they weren't yeah. deceived. They did run to the hills because mm -hmm. they saw the armies coming and they escaped. They stayed in Jerusalem to preach the gospel to those Jews who were still persecuting Christians. They wanted them to follow Jesus and not be destroyed at the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They understood what Jesus said. That's why they continued preaching the gospel. But they fled when Jesus warned them to flee and they weren't destroyed. They went to the hill countries of Pella and they were not destroyed and they were not besieged as in the others were. So the thousand years is the time before, yeah. uh, I mean, yeah. between the resurrection of Christ and the destruction of Jerusalem. It was that it's, period that Jesus said, that generation. Yeah. Uh, then he was stopped from, yeah, he, he, I, I see. But it was it, not talking about a literal devil. You're talking about a system. Yeah, it's yeah, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so used to thinking <laughs> What it, you know, is, the devil is not what it's talking about. It's talking about a system which was limited. It could not stop the gospel, even though it tried. It couldn't do it. But it's a thousand years. It's a long time. It's not. A, it's not a, a thousand figure. years. Is very... Yeah, but it's not a literal thousand years. Why do you think it's a literal thousand years when it talks about chains and it talks about people? It's it's all figurative, yeah. very symbolic language, which. You know, it's taken. I remember Bill, yeah, yeah. Bill Johnson once said, you know, you, you read Revelation 20. So I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding a key yeah. to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He took hold of the dragon, the serpent. So do we think that's a literal dragon? Do we think it's a literal serpent? Do we think is a literal devil and Satan and bound him for a literal thousand years? No. So we know those are figurative, but then we take the thousand years as literal. Mm -hmm. But it's all in the figurative cycle of what was going to go on during mm -hmm. that period where the accusers and it's the same thing that's described in the parable of the sheep and the goats mm -hmm. of them affecting the brethren. Their being their treatment of the Christians would be bringing judgment upon them, which was what happened. So it's all figurative language used, but they understood we have lost the understanding and we've come up with all sorts of fanciful things to try and explain these things. Yeah. yeah. But what about the, the the verses where it says about the judgment that uh, the dead will be judged according yeah. to what they have done? Uh, yeah. Is but, the, but, yeah. They, but we're talking again, not about individual people. We're talking mm -hmm. about a system and judgment is a verdict. So a verdict was passed on the system. Mm -hmm. And those people who were in the system were found not to be following Jesus. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about forever here. This was the, uh, so the resurrection was a resurrection spiritually. That mm -hmm. took place during that period and you, it talks about that in daniel 12 as well 
where the day of resurrection and the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, you know, these are all terminologies talking about this end of the old system. The day of the Lord has come. The end, the last days. They're not talking about the end of the world. They're talking about the end of the system. So when you read it covenantally and you're looking at it from a covenantally place, you know, it's not supposed to be taken literally. You know, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and the presence of the earth and heaven fled. Well, the presence of earth and heaven fled was talking about the temple system. Mm -hmm. Because that was the heavens and the earth where the heavens and the earth met in the temple. So there was no place found for them in the temple anymore because the system had come to an end. It's very much symbolic language. You know, and the books that were opened were, were books talking, were Jewish books. They were talking about the, the, they had Jewish system of generations written within the books that gave them Jewish ancestry. So these, these were all figurative of things that they understood. You know, mm -hmm. um, but it, it was never supposed to be taken literally. You know, death and Hades gave up. So literally, there's a sense where people have sort of ideas of timing. When Jesus emptied Sheol, did he empty it when he went into heaven or did he empty it at the day of the resurrection and judgment at AD 70? And I think this is what it's talking about of the, the all those who were in Sheol were then brought before God and they were separated sheep and goats. But it's not talking about the end of the world. It's talking about no. the end of that system. And of course, it is very symbolic. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Well, the lake of fire is the second death. That means death was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what Jesus came to do. To destroy the works of the evil one, which was the wages of sin is death. So he came to overcome death. Which is what he did during the mm -hmm. resurrection. And then that was fully outworked. So, you know, you've got a lot of things there. Anyone's name was not booked in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Except well, what's that? But the book of life was a Jewish book. So those who were, <laughs> were, were then put into what was fire? Fire was a purifying, <laughs> refining fire. So if those were not following, were not righteous, they were therefore unrighteous therefore they would go through the fires of purification and the jewish people didn't believe in a hell they believed that if you did not follow god you would go to a place of refining fire and they believed it was for 11 months for some reason i don't know why but that was what their understanding was they never understood of an eternal torment forever they didn't have that concept so, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there which is not literal and it's covenantal and it's supposed to be. And it's talking about the end of the old covenant system that was coming to an end, become obsolete, was fading away. And then finally was ended, as Jesus said it would, within that generation. You know, and if you if you read the book in context, you're not going to try and understand it, you know, from this literal modern day but you you know those people who say oh we literally believe the bible well they don't literally believe there's a bible with uh, a devil or a dragon with 12 heads they know it's referring to rome or referring to a system but they think oh well we take it literally but it's not supposed to be a literal book it's a hugely symbolic book but it says where the beast and the false prophets were, they were thrown yeah. into the lake of fire yeah. and south where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Yeah, but the word torment. Uh -huh. And when you look at the word there in fire, brimstone, all of that stuff, brimstone is a was actually the, the word for a touchstone that tested them to see whether they were pure like gold it was used to test gold see the word brimstone is the word theos which is presence of god wow when you look at wow. it and the word brimstone, for torment, 
Yeah, brimstone. That's what the word meant. The 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 if you look at the word and the the uh, actual word for brimstone, actually the word is theos. Mm. When you look at it in in its thing, if I if I bring up that verse, um, which is Revelation twenty verse ten. Yeah. If I bring that up in a Bible dictionary, okay, in like Bible Hub, okay, and we have a look at it, I'll bring it up. I'll have a look at it. Revelation 20, verse 10. Okay. And you look at it there um, in, in the interlinear, okay, um, which is... I'm going to find my Bible hub interlinear in a minute, but you'll find that it's theos. And if, and if you look at the word for torment, it's testing. So the word for torment was a touchstone that tested the purity. It wasn't about tormenting anybody. It was testing things. You know, and, and I think this is the problem. People have taken very much um, sort of language of, today and try to understand greek and understand what it meant in greek and, and to be honest it, it doesn't mean those things which have been translated into english because of a wrong understanding and uh, unfortunately the understanding has has sort of been written from a modern perspective um, and it, it doesn't mean that so if you actually go through let's find the things false but we're tormented uh, the word tormented there is banastianatonai and that is what was done as a touchstone um and then you've got some things in there you've got things that are actually not even in the original um language so if you read that if you read it in in the new american standard the devil and deceive were thrown in the lake in fire and brimstone okay and we read that in uh this version the lake of fire and theo so brimstone is the word it's actually the word uh i can go back into strong's T H E I O N. And actually, properly, and when you actually look at it, it's where the word Theo God is. So they've turned it into sulfur because sulfur was a substance that was for purification. Mm. So, so they've written it using an original word uh, which actually talked about God. That's That's the root of it. Mm. you know but you know, unfortunately um we're 2000 years on and when you read these things it's quite difficult when you read it in the right context uh the wrong context to actually look at that um, so if you look at some of the other words there um, and particularly the one which is for torment and you look at the word torment uh, and you, you sort of go into Strong's concordance and you look at the original. Pro, you know, this is where it says, OK, tormenting trial. OK, then you say it says properly. To examine, to test. Mm -hmm. Not to torment. You mm -hmm. don't torment gold to test it. Mm -hmm. You examine it to see if it's pure. You don't mm. torment it. But unfortunately, literally, torture. See, to examine, and then there's a literally, well, we're using torture. Well, actually, the original word didn't mean torture. It meant to test as a touchstone. And, you know, literally, properly. And this is like, you go into the Greek lexicon of Thayer's, which is a Greek sort of, a guy who translated and used a dictionary for Greek. It says this, Thayer's Greek lexicon, one, properly. And whenever you hear it say properly or read it say properly, it means this is what it actually means. 
okay? To test metals by the touchstone. That's what it meant. Then it sends mm -hmm. the second thing said, oh, oh, to torture. Mm -hmm. But actually the original didn't mean that. No. But they've taken it to mean that because, oh, well, that fits into being cast into fire. Well, what mm -hmm. was fire for? To purify and refine. That was what fire was for. In in the Old Testament, it talks about God coming like a refiner's fire and a fuller soap to purify mm -hmm. and refine. So the fire of God's love is not to torture or torment, but to purify and refine. People may feel tormented by it, but it's self-torment because they realize that they're there in this place because of what they've chosen to do. You know, and unfortunately, we have a modern translation into English, which has a preconceived idea with what a lot of these things mean. Rather than the Greek could mean various things and what and the actual original meaning of Greek was not to torture, but to test by fire, a touchstone to test the purity of a metal, what the word literally meant. But we've got a figurative meaning of the word. Oh, well, that must mean torture. Well, you don't torture metal. You just test it. Yeah. And, and you know, unfortunately, you know, we run into all of these type of problems because we're reading a, a version in English, uh, you know. Yeah, because in verse nine it says, "And they marched up over the you know you know the the big battle, mm. right? And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. Yeah, but, but fire came yeah. down from heaven. But fire yeah. didn't come down on the Roman army to destroy them. No. The fire." So is that the wrong translation then in verse 9? Because it's talking about the city and it's talking about believers from the city yeah. who were saved. But the actual thing, this is language that comes obviously from, uh, from Ezekiel, I think, were Gog and Magog and all this stuff. Um, they were saved. Yes, they were oh, saved. Yeah. Ultimately, you have this picture of the enemy coming to destroy Christians are saved, but the fire purifies the city, purifies the old covenant. Okay. The new, effectively. In other words, destroys the old, but brings about the new. It's, it's mm. all apocalyptic language, which you're just never going to understand if you try and read it literally. You know, obviously, mm. we know Gog and Magog are symbols that, or words for things in this, and they, you know, but they're not literal things. The, the you know the battle of Armageddon. Well, it's a symbolic battle for the end of the old again, where mm -hmm. the old will be destroyed. Yeah, yeah. But it's written in language to help people who were not Jews understand, and people who were Jews to see what was coming. Because remember, this was written as a warning mm. to get out of Jerusalem not to stay into jerusalem yeah but it's written it's all sorts of different language you know they came up upon a broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the beloved city you know well this is language which is designed to say this is this is the old city of jerusalem this is the city but actually the city was going to be destroyed the old covenant was going to be destroyed, but it's using language here to help them decide. Now, obviously, it's a warning. Matthew 24 was a warning. Luke 21 was a warning. They were warnings that Jesus gave. You know, um, but I think, you know, you've got to be careful mm -hmm. to read it, not trying to think of this talking about the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it was not going to happen at the end of the world, the end of the age. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very big difference between the word for age and the word for world. But it's often translated that because it fits in with a futurist perspective. But it's age. Yeah, 
Aeneos is age, not world. But, you know, I understand people will have all sorts of their opinions about it. And you could go arguing about it for years. And, and people who don't have revelation of what it's referring to are going to stick with their thing. I mean, I used to believe all that. I believe this was a thousand years that was coming in. Jesus was going to come back on earth and reign for a thousand years. And the church is all going to be taken to heaven. And this was all talking about Jew Jewish people because Israel was going to be the earthly people and the church were the heavenly people. Now, all of that was based in the same deception as the rapture teaching, millennium teaching, Zionist teaching all came from brethren teaching, which created dispensationalism in the 1820s to 30s. Um, through John Nelson Darby, which they became Prim Plymouth Brethren. And they came up with this system, which was eventually used in American seminaries through the Schofield Reference Bible, who had a lot of notes which were based on Brethrenism and Dispensationalism. So the m millennium was a dispensation that was to come at the end of the world. Well, nowhere does Jesus teach that and nowhere else in the Bible is only in those few verses in one apocalyptical symbolic book. And yet we've developed this massive system of belief. Then looking at Old Testament passages, which were looking at, which are talking about, you know, symbolically talking about the new covenant age um, and then applying it to this period where, oh, the, you know, the lion would lie down with the lamb and all this stuff. Well, yeah. We're talking about essentially there would be one new man in Christ. There would be no divisions, no separation between Jew and Gentile anymore, which is what Paul taught. One new man in Christ, not dividing an earthly people into a heaven and a heavenly people. That's completely opposite of what Paul taught in Ephesians 2. There's one new man in Christ. The middle wall of partition is removed. There is no longer alien from the Commonwealth of Israel. No, everyone is now one new man in Jesus, who is the Israel of God. He is the fulfillment of all the promises of God. They're not to be fulfilled in an earthly people. They're fulfilled in Jesus and we are included in Jesus because we're in him. Included in him and everything he's done to fulfill all the promises of God as the seed of Abraham. To bring the blessing to all the work, families of the earth. All the families of the earth, not just one family of the earth, but all of them would receive the blessing of the gospel preached beforehand to Abraham, which was all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Well, he wasn't talking about literally blessed through Abraham, but Abraham's seed, who is Jesus, who is the seed, not seeds. So it's not talking about figuratively literal offspring of abraham as physical people but the seed of abraham who is jesus which is how he's described as the seed of abraham in in galatians and in romans you know is you know, that's jesus you know but you know it's you're never going to convince people or try and get people to believe this if they don't have a deconstruction of their condition teaching. I had a deconstruction of eschatology back in the mid eighties when God took me through it all and God taught me what it meant. And that was a long, long time ago, you know, and I have since the mid eighties not believed in the rapture or the millennium or any of those things. Now it was a process because to start with, it was like, oh, maybe this is talking about, oh, Jesus is going to come after the millennium. And then it's like, well, no, this is not talking about any of that. This is talking about all of talking about the end of the old and the beginning of the new. So it took some time to come to that position. Um, but ultimately, I used to be a dispensationist. I used to be part of the Brethren Church. I used to believe in all that stuff because I was conditioned to believe it but i never looked at it myself i never looked at what it what jesus was talking about 
I just believed, oh, this was the end of the world. I just believe, well, this is the last days. In the last days, there will be, people will fall away. Yeah, they did. When under persecution by Rome and the Jews, people, Christians did fall away during the last days of the old and the beginning, at the full beginning of the new. They did. Terrible things went on. You know, Christians were tortured and persecuted. And, you know, you had the whole catacombs where Christians were buried because they were afraid of being, you know, public burials. They couldn't, weren't allowed to do public burials. So they did the catacombs. You know, I went to Rome last year and went to the catacombs. And it was quite a moving thing when you, and they still had places there where they had, you know, family areas where they were there and there were symbols of early church stuff with different things. It's very moving. Um, but that was all during this period, you know, it, and onwards after this period where persecution continued they were no longer persecuted by the jews but they were still persecuted by the romans yeah it's 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 a complex subject that people have written books of a thousand pages about but i think you've got to look at what resonates with the love of god and with jesus don't interpret this separately from jesus you have to interpret it through what Jesus said. Jesus never said there was going to be a thousand years to come. Jesus said he was never said he was going to come back and reign on earth. Mm. Never said that the kingdom of God was within you. Mm. Yeah. So Jesus is how we interpret what the future is. And Jesus gave them a very clear pattern of what the next 40 years were going to be. After that, there is nothing in the Bible that talks about anything specific. It just we are in the new covenant age, the age of the restoration of all things, where the kingdom of God is filling the earth. And of course, Jesus said how it would fill the earth. As leaven leavened a lump of dough. That was how Jesus said it would fill the earth. He didn't say anything else. So it's a long process of infiltration and transformation which we're still in and everything is ultimately being restored bit by bit by bit and more and more people are coming into the kingdom one by one by one slowly infiltrating the world in which then the world will then begin to recognize who god is through people who are operating in love you know, and we have been very, very bad ambassadors of reconciliation through the ages, trying to get people to follow Jesus by the sword or the gun or by all sorts of force or coercion, where it's about love. I mean, how could they get it so wrong and try and make force people to become Christians? I mean, in the Viking era. It's like the Christians try to force Vikings to become Christians, get baptized or we're going to kill you. And it's madness. And then you've got Vikings trying to force other Vikings, Christian Vikings trying to force other Vikings to become Christian. More persecution by force rather than by love. You know, the gospel spreads through love. It will never spread through violence and force. That is what people do. They try and take it by force. The violent take the kingdom by force. They try to do it. That's what they did in Christendom and throughout history. They tried to force people to accept God by the sword. I mean, how far can that be away from Jesus' teaching as the Prince of Peace to love one another and forgive one another and love one another? That's ultimately the good news thank you so much i still don't understand all of it but i will work on it it's well, just to be honest to be honest i would not, i would encourage you not even bother to try <laughs> because you'll just get more and more confused for yeah. no reason there should be a paraphrase of something oh, about there is. This. well you can read you can read the mirror bible the mo the that does, doesn't have revelation does it yes it does yeah the, the modern the, the latest updates of the mirror bible have the revelation in it oh then i'm going to look at that <laughs> that's a better yeah. idea
Yeah, and that gives a much more sort of clear. But even there, you're still trying to understand something which wasn't written for you. It wasn't. Uh, yeah, I know. That's and that's why it's so difficult. And I've heard so many different yeah. uh, experiences and completely, you know, opposite. And I just got so confused in the end. But yeah. actually, in the end, I also came to this. Uh, I read some books of Jonathan Welton. And yeah. I also was, I, and then I started to read the New Testament mm. with a completely different yeah. perspective. And, and you th realize that a lot of it was never written for you specifically. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly, exactly. And things just open up, you know, in a very <laughs> different way. But it's just this chapter that I've had a problem with. Mm. So that I will read the Mirror Bible. <laughs> yeah, you know, and. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, we have we've got a lot of issues with years and years of a well, few hundred years of infiltration of false doctrine into the church, which has mm -hmm. made this just be what it is, you know, and people mm -hmm. have just accepted what it is. But there's there's explanations and different alternatives for all of it. But to be honest, why spend your time trying to understand something which was never written for you in the first place? Because all no, it's just fans ask me, you know, I feel I have to somehow give them some kind of answer. Well, I don't and... I wouldn't I wouldn't try, to be honest. I would say, okay. look, all of this, all of this stuff, whether it's true, let's go back to the simplicity of the gospel Jesus talked about. Let's love one another. We don't have to agree. Let's love one another. Let's love the world um, mm. rather than trying to convince someone of something. Let the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit's the only one who can renew someone's mind. Mm. You know, and if they're genuine, then you can have a conversation. But if they're just trying to prove you wrong, then mm. it's a waste of time. If someone's genuinely yeah. searching and thinking, you oh, know, I'm, I'm struggling because because this doesn't align with god and it you know and god doesn't you know how can how could this be god you know well there there's someone's on a journey towards restoration and renewal of their mind then you you can help people along that path but mm. you know if they all they want to do is just try and convince you that you're wrong yeah and that there's going to be tribulation and judgment and a millennium and you know yeah. all of that then that is a very deceptive doctrine and you won't argue someone out of it okay only god can so change sad. It's so sad it is you know, it's very sad and and i some of my friends i just mm. they, they're trying to prove to me that i'm somehow yeah on the wrong path and i had i can't go there so much and i found this other church mm. and that's what she, like you said it's very simple love mm. each other yeah very simple not a lot of theology not a lot of the just, just keep it simple very keep simple, simple, simple. And it's love one another. church the old swedish yeah. church that yeah. was the church in sweden yeah. <laughs> i am so but i'm glad i found it but it's completely different from where i went before and i'm trying to go there and i hope it will work out but if they say something that that I don't feel is completely right or completely wrong, I just will leave it. You know, yeah, I, I won't think Bless about them. it because them. Message it's true. they're on a journey. Let them let yeah. them go on their own journey in towards it. And ultimately, I think God will renew many many people's minds, deconstruct a lot of people, but a lot of people will be mm -hmm. stuck in religion and stuck in the system sadly but a lot of people are leaving it and a lot of people are coming to a different view mm. of god and it's helping mm. them discover god is love by loving them mm. and loving them yeah exactly it's better to mm. love them than to argue with them it's better to keep a friend than win an mm. argument and lose a friend yeah you know and i think so. for and i think by saying to look you know I, I don't really want to get into a lot of this stuff because i think it will just cause problems in our relationship and i value our relationship more than being right yeah and leave it at that mm. you know yeah um, but it mm. is you know it is a 
difficult deception that keeps people in darkness and in bondage, which mm. only God can bring the light into, ultimately. Mm. You know, if people had tried to convince me that my eschatology was wrong back in the 80s, I wouldn't have believed them. But God spoke mm. to me. God did it. Well, I can't mm. argue with God. I just went mm. on a journey where he unfolded a whole different view that I'd never, ever even imagined. And I, I didn't read books about it. God showed me through the spirit by going through the whole thing. And once I then realized that my whole understanding had been twisted, then I found some books which gave some credence to that. And I realized, wow, I'm not on my own. Loads of other people believe this as well. But I didn't go and find it through other people. God totally deconstructed me over a two or three year period himself. You know, then that got confirmed by me reading other things. And there, you know, there are people that were helpful to me. David Chilton, you know, Paradise Restored, The Great Tribulation. He was and I read uh, Days of Vengeance, which are his book on Revelation, a you know, massive book. You can find all these things online for free. You know, you can find PDFs of, of the Great Tribulation of Paradise Restored and the Days of Vengeance online. Now, David Chilton started off as a partial preterist in that he believed the book of chapter 20 was still future. But he ended up a full preterist because he came to realize that it was all in the past. And he got himself excommunicated from from the group he was in because he believed that because he was persecuted but mm -hmm. inevitably i think if you are open you will move through partial preterism into preterism now i don't want to be labeled a preterist or not because there are other things within that system that i don't think necessarily are true but i i'm let's say i'm a realized eschatologist you know that all eschatology is realized it's it is already the end the study of the last things as is the study of what happened in the past not the study of what will happen in the future you know so for me that is where you know i've moved towards um and then ultimately my understanding of that and the same bible verses that talk about what would happen at the end of the old covenant also talk about and have been interpreted what is hell so then that was like ah so i don't believe this is talking about the end of the world so this also isn't the end of the world so gehenna is not hell gehenna is literally again talking about the end of the age when the old covenant was put into the fire and destroyed and actually jerusalem and the people were put into the fire in gehenna if they continued in jerusalem as jesus warned them that would happen they did the Romans crucified hundreds of thousands and burned them in Gehenna. Now, that wasn't the end of their life. That is the end of their physical body. Their actual soul would go into the fire of God's love and hopefully bring about their restoration. And I imagine a lot of people would have remembered what Jesus said when the armies turned up but it was too late if they were besieged and they would have probably remembered what jesus said you're going to end up in gehenna and hopefully they would have also then remembered jesus's offer of life you know um, you know but that that's what happened with me you know my eschatology got deconstructed and then the same verses led me to a view of hell doesn't exist in the form that i thought it did in fact hell doesn't exist at all because it's not even in the bible but it does talk about gehenna it does talk about hades it does talk about sheol the grave so it talks about those things but it also talks about them in a restorative way not a punishment way that is a big change of yes. the mind <laughs> it is and True. you know yeah. and i know it's hard because i've been through it mm -hmm. but i've been through it and i've continued the process of realizing a lot of what i was taught is referring to 
the period of transition out of the old into the new until the end finally came. Yeah. And that is the end. No prophecy after that. Yeah. All was fulfilled. And Jesus actually said that. He said, unless the this comes to an end, and he said, unless every I is dot and every T is crossed and all that, and, uh, then the end won't come. And, well, the end did come. So that is the mm -hmm. end. All things were fulfilled, it says in Luke. All things mm -hmm. were fulfilled. Every prophetic statement was fulfilled. All the promises of God were fulfilled in Jesus, it says in Corinthians. All the covenants were therefore mm -hmm. fulfilled because covenants are promises. You know, so they all got fulfilled. You know, and I think that then draws a line under it. So let's listen to God and Jesus and the Spirit every day. Because they're speaking to us, not through yeah. a book, but mm. in our inner small voice as they dwell in us. Mm. And there are a lot of people who aren't listening to that voice. Mm. And a lot of yeah. people obviously don't even know that voice exists in them yet. But mm. God is not going to stop until they do. Mm. In revealing mm. the truth of their inclusion in Christ their reconciliation in Christ and their forgiveness through what Jesus mm. did on the cross, which is an amazing good news testimony, which the world needs to hear. Yeah. Not yeah. They're all going to be cast into hell if they don't accept Jesus. That's not a good news testimony. No. Bad news. Let's give good news. Yeah. And I think the world will begin to find God who is a God of love and who loves them too much to let them be lost eternally for punishment. He loves them too much for that. He loves them. And he's already, according to Ephesians 1, 4, already made sure, predestined them to become restored to face-to-face -to -face intimacy. It's predestined mm -hmm. into that. Even before the foundation of the world. Yeah, that was predestined that everyone would eventually be restored. But people can resist that restoration. But people cannot resist God's love forever. I don't believe God's no. love will never fail mm -hmm. and will mm -hmm. never stop until everyone is fully restored back into relationship with him because he loves us. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.